we are going to talk about scheduling learned flow today um, with my special guest, Scott Hunt. Scott is the, what is your title with the city, Scott? Irrigation specialist. So you are the irrigation specialist for the city of Colorado Springs. Um, we met actually on this site last season. Uh, this is America the Beautiful, which is one of the many beautiful parks that you guys maintain. And because it had the Purple Mountain Majesty in the background, I thought I would highlight this as your kind of. That's a very Colorado, nice park. city of Colorado Springs picture. That's a good um, choice. So we will. Um, start what we want to talk about today is scheduling learn flow um, and that is a conversation that starts with the desire to add flow function to your irrigation systems right <laughs> when we talk about weather track flow features um, it is something that every weather track is capable of providing but to get flow features accomplished we have to add flow devices onto your system and it isn't part of what the controller can do without help so um, when we are talking about adding flow and learning flow, it starts with the process of adding flow sensors onto your irrigation system. And we see some options here, right? Some flow solutions that WeatherTrack provides. But the idea is by putting flow sensors in place, we start to watch the gallons. And once we start watching those gallons closely, we can see an issue like this as it happens and provide a reaction that will minimize the amount of water that we lose, right? The amount of landscape that we lose, the amount of time that we lose. Uh, this can be a very, very serious, serious issue, right? Scott, you've done some investigation on exactly how much water an irrigation break can cost you. Can you share that oh. with us? <clears throat> so we've got anywhere from two inch, three inch, four inch, six inch up to 10 inch main lines uh, here at the city. And so I did a few calculations based on a six inch main line running nine feet per second uh, with hundred PSI behind it. It's running just under 900 gallons per, sec, uh, per minute. And uh, if you were to let that run for five hours it would fill an NHL size hockey rink up three feet deep in under that time. So when you think of that amount of water with that much power behind it and the damage that it can do um, having a flow sensor and a functioning master valve that's set up correctly through the controller is just it's uh it's it's paramount it's a critical part right it, and, and i as a water nerd have to be careful because it is an option it's not part of the standard the package that weather track provides uh, it is something that people have to actively kind of add on um, and so we always have to kind of quarantine that as part of the conversation right we there's a lot of different ways that we save water with weather track uh, including the uh, weather-based irrigation schedules including the central control that provides all of the visibility right those are all some avenues to save some water but in my opinion all of that can easily disappear with an event like this, right? You go back to this picture and you could spend all season long saving water doing weather-based irrigation and one event like this, kiss that, all that savings goodbye. <laughs> yeah, just another comment on that. You know, a lot of times with Springs Utilities, if we have an event like that, they will discount the price of an event like that when it comes to the water loss. Um, but for the most part, you know, it's, it can, it can cut into our water budget for the year. So when we talk about our parks being watered in inches, uh, an event like that could take an inch overnight real quick, you know, so you're struggling throughout the rest of the growing season uh, because of that loss. So, yeah. So what we see is once we add that flow sensor, right, we're going to talk about getting it programmed in the in the right way. Um, but from the highest level, what we're doing is watching those gallons and comparing them to what they should be, right? We know how many gallons you should be using and how many gallons you are using. And the, the weather track is smart enough to compare those two actively. And if there's a, a significant difference that it creates an alert, right? We, um, 
the best way I know how to describe it is with this graph. For every station, we'll have a range of expected flow because irrigation systems are dynamic. So uh, if I learn an irrigation station runs at 20 gallons a minute, that means that when I tested it, it ran at 20 gallons a minute, but that night pressure situation is gonna change on that city water main, right? And, that, and there's a lot of moving parts that affect how that system will run. And so when that system runs tonight, it might run at 22 gallons a minute. It might run at 18 gallons a minute, right? So we, uh, with WeatherTrack, we create this expected flow range we don't want to hit a very exact mark, but live inside of a window. And if we go outside of that window, that's where we start to create alerts, right? The mainline break threshold is a system-wide do not pass kind of level. But then for every station, we'll have a station high flow and a low flow, right? So if it wavers too far away from the expected range, we'll be able to manage that as well as Leak is universal, right? That means that water is running during non-irrigation hours, but no flow is specific for station. We tried to prompt irrigation and we got nothing out. All these can lead to um, guys like Scott out in the field chasing down issues, right? It tells you uh, not only what to expect when you get on site, but where to go, what stations are affected. Um, and Scott, can you speak to kind of the efficiency that you see with responding, identifying and responding to issues using those flow sensors? Well, um, not only having a, a functioning flow sensor that, at, that has learned flow, which we'll go over here shortly, um, but having a functional master valve, uh, especially when it comes to a mainline leak, you know, that flow sensor will tell the controller that something's up and uh, the master valve is what's gonna shut that main line off. And, uh, you know, when it comes to the station flows, you know, you get a head kicked off or something like that, and it senses a high flow on a certain station or something like that, it has the ability to skip that station and move on to the next one. Does that answer your question? Yeah, exactly right. And uh, where I was going was with, with that alert, right, when you get that alert notification mm -hmm. as the person responding, um, included in that is the station that was firing, right? So when you log in in the morning, you can see the sites that you need to visit, the controllers oh, right. that you need to visit, and the exact stations that you need to go attend to to, to minimize the, the loss, right? Right. So is a great efficiency tool for keeping your irrigation tech, techs uh, running to trouble, finding the places that are broken rather than testing systems to find out they aren't broken. Yeah, generally we've got the techs set up uh, with the uh, SMS system where they'll just get a, an alert via text message in the morning and they'll know where to respond, uh, what system, uh, or sorry, what, what zones to maybe do a wet test on based on those alerts and uh, go from there. So it's, it's a very valuable tool. Perfect. So now that we've kind of set the stage for what we're doing with, with the flow sensing, let's talk about the subject of the day, which is setting up the learn flow test and specifically we'll get to scheduling that learn flow test. Um, so I'm going to go back to sharing my screen and instead of looking at the PowerPoint, we're gonna be done with this guy. And we are going to go over to weathertrack.net. Um, and here at weathertrack.net, right, I logged in with my username and password. Um, and when you log in, you'll land on the home page. And where we want to start with the conversation about setting up your system for the learn flow test happens here on the program page. This isn't where we'll finish, but this is where we get started. Lots of great information here and setup required before that learn flow test happens. So uh, I have already expanded my, I'm on my program page and I go to my flow menu. And this is where we set up the components that we have already installed on the system. 
this is a super important step <laughs> and should be done well before we try and execute the learn flow test, right? The a critical part of learning flow is having a flow sensor properly installed, properly calibrated and accurately reading flow before we try and do any of this stuff, right? right. Uh, and we've all learned the hard way once or twice. So it's always nice to hear, but for sure, uh, the, the finish line that we have to cross before we learn flow is seeing the system accurately reading flow um, on the display before we try and do any of this. Right. And to do that, we have to go in and set up our flow components, right? So we go to our program page, we go to our flow menu, we identify what type of master valve we have. Is it normally open or normally closed? Uh, we go in here and we can, we turn on the flow sensor and with WeatherTrack, uh, all of our compatible flow sensors or a vast majority of our compatible flow sensors are identified in the drop down menu by product number, right? So um, you can see that we're compatible with more than just WeatherTrack flow sensors. The WeatherTrack flow threes are on here, but so are the creative sensor technology uh, PVCT, right? So all of the, the flow sensors that you might be using are here and we will apply all of the information to the program that makes that flow sensor read accurately, right? right. We have all the different K and offset values programmed in. Anything on that, Scott, before we move on? Uh, not that portion, Ben. Okay, so let's talk about this next portion, which is what I know you have some ideas about. Um, when we're setting up the learn flow test, there is a function of the breaks that we have to attend to. Okay, so there is this mainline break alert threshold that if during the flow test, we pass that threshold, it's gonna create an alert and it's gonna provide the, the mainline break alert reaction, which shuts stuff down and interferes with the test. Right. So there is this function where we can go and uh, I used to condone turning these off um, I've been convinced that turning them to alarm only is the best way of doing this. Um, but the, the controller comes to alarm and action or comes default to alarm and action. So that means in this case, if we're running the learn flow test and for whatever reason, our system starts to measure a hundred gallons a minute, it's gonna try and shut that system down. It's gonna interfere with the flow test. Um, that's the action, right? The action is the interference. The alarm is just the identification that something has, something is amiss. Right. And so I used to say we want to come and turn these off, but whether you turn them off or turn them to alarm only, um, they will not interfere with the learn flow test. Anything on that, Scott? Uh, no, just that we set our thresholds at whatever our our largest zone for that system would be, say it's 120 gallons a minute. We're gonna go a little bit above that because between switching from one zone to another, it's still filling the main line. You may be at 120 gallons a minute, you may be running at 150. So there's a little bit of trial and error there, but that's, that's pretty much all I have to say about that portion. And I would be a little bit more detailed on that. And it's not your largest, I didn't, talk about it not as your largest zone, but as your highest anticipated flow rate, right? Because uh, with your parks, you're running one big station at a time. But right. if you do have the capacity to run multiple stations, yes. uh, it, if you're running multiple stations, the the um, you can exceed that mainline break threshold. So um, that's where you got to be cognizant of your highest anticipated flow. If you're running two stations at 50 gallons a minute together, uh, you want to set that to over that 100 gallon per minute, add that 15 to 20% that Scott talked about over your highest anticipated flow. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. We do have systems that are running even three and four zones at a time, and I just didn't think to mention that. So Right. I've done this once or twice. So um, the next setting we want to talk about is no flow. And I have a strong opinion about where I set my no flow and leak alerts. 
uh, I found the best thing for me is to uh, set those to the exact tolerance of the flow sensor you have in the ground, right? Um, you, when you install your flow sensor, you'll know the published value that it's accurate down to and accurate up to on the low side and on the high side. And I always put the lowest accurate reading as my no flow alert, because anything under that is just going to be noise um, and not accurately read. Is that how you do it? Or do you have a different strategy that you use, Scott? I think with that, we've been kind of sticking with the default, which I think is like five, uh, if I'm correct about that. But we have had to. Uh, change it on a few sites um, but th that's a that's a really good rule of thumb that there is a certain amount of flow that a flow sensor at the bare minimum can read so that's that's a great way to go well i always look at that right i of course turn this off for the learn flow test but then um, set those limits up and when i have delivered the learn flow test and i come back to set these values up right you said uh, you want to set this mainline break above the highest thresholds. Um, the same is true for the stations that are below those lowest thresholds. Mm -hmm. Those are stations you're going to want to use this feature called uh, exclusion. You want to exclude those stations from no flow and low flow monitoring that can't be picked up by your flow sensor. So if you have a flow sensor that's only accurate down to 10 gallons a minute, let's say, and you have a drip station that runs at seven gallons a minute, um, you would go and exclude that station from low flow and no flow monitoring because it's below the accurate level of your flow sensor. It's gonna create all sorts of havoc on, on your readings. It's gonna right. prompt no flow alerts very routinely because there's not enough water to spin that flow sensor wheel. And so it'll miss pulses and create alerts. So to manage that, we exclude any station lower than um, or that that uses less water than our flow sensor is capable of managing. Um, we go and exclude them from no flow and low flow monitoring. Uh, do you use that feature, Scott? We do. Um, and actually, when it comes to drip zones that may potentially follow uh, a larger zone. We've, we've seen you know, high flows on those zones uh, pretty consistently because of that mainline filling time. You know, we've got some really long main lines that takes, takes a while for it to slow down, which could be over that three minute threshold that we set. Um, so we've had to exclude some of those low flowing drip zones, even though the, the flow sensor is capable of reading that low flow uh, we've had to exclude some of those zones because they followed something that that was trying to fill the main line for too long. So that makes sense. And that's where this delay conversation comes in, right? Um, that delay is the time that the system will right. allow that pipe fill to happen before we test. So right. um, we really do build that in. We're not going to, uh, we know that the system is dynamic, pipe fill happens. We've got to let everything pressurize and normalize before we test it. So that's uh, what this delay number represents. That's the time that will elapse before um, we test any station for those particular alerts. And then the extra settings that we have in just the, the normal setup, uh, flow alert clearing, you can set up to alert once and that station will stay off until somebody manually comes out and clears the alert or you can set your weather track up to automatically clear all of your flow alerts every night and retest all of those stations. And there's different workflows that uh, would point you in the right direction to which one you would choose. Scott, do you have a preference on this? Do you guys have a standard on flow clearing? Uh, generally manual. Um because we want the guys to go out and check the site or myself to go out and check the site before we just clear an alert um, whenever possible. Yeah, that's how Fort Carson does it too. Fort Carson is my example of, they never wanna let the commanding officer see broken irrigation systems run. So right. when a flow alert is raised, they send somebody out boots on the ground to check it out before they clear it. Um, 
the other side of that is my other classic example is Walmart, who has a revolving door of contractors coming in and out testing that system. And sometimes they fix things without clearing the alert. Um, and so they had they found perfectly good irrigation systems that had been repaired that still weren't running because they were set to manual clear. So right. it's a preference for anyone. Yeah, and some of the supervisors might set theirs differently based on how they want to react. So, uh, but generally I keep mine on manual. I like that choice as well. And then this offset is the, when we talked about the flow range, right? We, ex that expected flow range, the way that this offset works is it establishes that window. So down here, we can, we can dip in and see that in action. So here on station four, we learned that station at 33 gallons a minute. When we performed the learn flow test on this station, it ran at 33 gallons per minute. But again, based on city pressure that could fluctuate from night to night. So we add 20% above and 20% below. That's established by this offset value up here. So you can change it. For example, I hate to lean on them again, but Walmart doesn't want a contractor to come out for every little thing. Uh, they want it to be officially a decent sized break before they allocate the resources to fix it. So they have elected to change their high flow offset to 30%, right? A 20% break doesn't warrant having an irrigation tech come out and respond, but a 30% break does. So um, that's kind of how you would use that um, and how that, that window gets created. We take the learn flow rate for a station, add 20% on either side in the defaults and create that expected flow range. Uh, anything to build on that, Scott? No, generally on those, we use the default, which is the 20%. We have had to bump it up to 25 or 30 on some sites, but what we found on those sites was something going on with the shielded cable or with the flow sensor itself that was, that was bringing it above those thresholds over and over again. So typically we use the 20%. Okay. So we have some questions, right? Um, <clears throat> Jerry asks, where do you start on the high flow, low flow percentage? I think we've covered that. Scott just said that he uses the defaults. Yeah. Uh, Walmart expands them. And I think that the defaults are uh, great where they are. Um, should you relearn flow at any time? That's a great, that's a personal management question that I would love to hear Scott answer. Um, you know, we relearn flow um, typically anytime there's an expansion on the system or a large repair. Um, if we're doing a retrofit on, on a station where we may be changing the flow or anything like that. And sometimes I'll do it at the beginning of a season just, just to make sure after I've done my full system check and we've got the system all fired up, everything's good to go. I may go ahead and relearn flow just to compare what it was running at last year and make sure that it's good to go for this season, so. Right, and I agree with that. Like, I think anytime that you make a change that will change the, uh, the operating value, right? Anytime you add heads, you need to relearn flow. If you change, nozzles um, from regular spray nozzles to, to low precip rate nozzles. Great examples of when you would always want to relearn flow. Um, beyond that, I have some people that, that set standards like we're gonna relearn flow every spring um, and that's a personal choice, but I would like to know, I would like to look at it across the long timeline, right? If we're slowly creeping up or slowly falling off, Right. Uh, I want to be able to to track that, and if we relearn flow too often, you'll lose kind of that level of resolution. So again, that's all personal preference. A good good question, um, and one that we should just touch on. So let's keep moving forward. Now let's jump into learning flow. Once you have everything set up, the ability to learn flow on these stations can happen either in real time, like now, or 
we have a great new feature where we can schedule this to happen. This was something that was asked for for many years and then slipped into the technology without much fanfare. <laughs> so I thought we would make it a, a topic of the day. So once you have your flow sensor reading accurately, right? And we verified that everything's reading accurately. Plus we have our setup on our program page done. We'll go to the smart irrigation tab and the learn flow page. And here we just set up the learn flow test. That's the exclusive domain of this page. Um, again, this can be done either one station at a time or for all stations. We can't learn flow just like we can't operate stations manually if they have alerts on them. So uh, you do want to clear any flow alerts that you have if you're trying to relearn flow for those stations. And then if you wanted to learn for all stations, you'd select all over here, right? This makes it super easy. I can select all or any station that I want to relearn. Um, so if I've just added a head on one zone, I don't have to relearn the whole controller, <laughs> right? right? I just go in and, and relearn that one station. Uh, or if it's a new setup, I just select the stations, I enter them in, and then you'll see here, you've queued these stations to learn, right? This is the state, these are the stations that I'm gonna um, re-up the learn flow value for. Now, We've always been able to do this. We've always, or for many years, we've been able to do this. Um, and we've done it traditionally by hitting this start learning button, which starts, sends the signal, gets the process started. Yeah. And as you're watching it, you'll see it update. You'll see the controller go into manual irrigation. You'll start to be able to update operating status and see flow happening out there in real time. And it's a little bit slower than you think because there is a step of processing in the cloud. But after six minutes, you'll start to see the, the flow rates start to populate on these stations. So it's something right. that you can watch happen. Um, anything to build on starting the test now, Scott? Does that make sense? So traditionally, before the scheduled learn flow uh, was available, that's that's how we had to do it. And that can be kind of complicated when you're talking about parks or public spaces, even some commercial properties where there's playgrounds and stuff like that. You've got to deal with the public. And, you know, when you've got 20, 30, 40 zones, you may not want to sit there and warn people as they're coming around you just want to let this thing learn and, and run its course for the next couple of hours. Well, that's a lot easier to do in the middle of the night. So the scheduled flow is definitely a big advantage for us because we can do it in the middle of the night instead of upsetting the public. And I like it because I have always had to break the news to guys like you. Hey, we can't schedule it. You've got to wake up at 1130 and start this learn flow test, which guys were never really that keen on hearing. So. Yeah, nobody's a big fan of that. <laughs> no, so uh, what we've added is this save and schedule button. So I've gone in and set up the, the stations that I have queued up to learn. But instead of starting that at this moment, I hit this save and schedule button. And this will, uh, we can rename the task. It'll definitely very clearly mark what we're trying to do. But then we just say, I want this to learn uh, March IO, March 10th at say 10 p.m. is when I want that learn flow test to start executing. And this is uh, super, super handy. Um, I especially like it for OptiFlow applications, right? Because sometimes when we implement OptiFlow, we've got other controllers that we need to learn flow on um, and scheduling it to happen rather than sitting around and doing one and waiting for it to finish and then doing the next right. one. Uh, can be a huge time saver. So just know that um, with OptiFlow, if you're using that application, uh, you might be pushed, you might get alerts that push back on you. They won't let you overlap. The, the OptiFlow system will say, controller A is still learning. You can't run controller B yet. So make sure that you know how long your learn flow tests take and how long the system will be busy doing that before you try and schedule multiple controllers.
Right. All right. Um, and that is once I hit save and close, that goes into the queue and it tells you right here that I have successfully scheduled to learn flow. And if I want to view that uh, event, I can just come over here and click that view and it'll take me to the details of when that's all gonna go down. Make sense? Questions on any of that? Let's check the chat box, see if anybody chatted me questions. Um, Steve Ray says, how do you find broken heads or small leaks if they are uh, only adjusting your flow rate slightly. They have to be outside of that tolerance, yeah. right? Steve, they have to, they have to break that 20% rule to, to be big enough to have an automated response. So right. um, I think that this is always justification for wet checks, right? Nothing's ever going to catch sprinklers running in the wrong directions. There's not a, your, your heads are watering the parking lot alert. Um, and there's, there's a, a certain window where we have acceptable breaks, which as an irrigation tech is, is hard to swallow. Um, right. So this automated system is really only for the bigger things. Uh, you can shave nozzles off and have it, have a, have a geyser going that's only costing you one or two gallons a minute and not big enough to, to cause an alert for sure. Right. Um, and then Alfonso says, in many drip valves, we're operating less than five gallons a minute. Absolutely. I think Alfonso's talking about uh, our settings, the conversation we had about setting no flow and, and uh, low flow alert thresholds. Right. So again, these are all going to be unique to every system that you manage. So your system is definitely going to have its own set of circumstances. Um, all right. Scott, let's wrap this thing up. All Tell right. me any thoughts you have on scheduling learn flow. Anything that we missed that you wanted to talk about? I think we pretty well covered it, Ben. Okay. Then uh, I want to finish up by asking you what I ask all of my first time special guests. What does WeatherTrack save you? Uh, I'd say for the most part, especially um, given the subject we've been talking about today, uh, it saves us water um, by the alarm and action through having flow set up properly and a controller that can let our techs know to go out and check the site and having master valves that work um, that will shut the system down if need be in a catastrophic event. So um, yeah, I would say that it saves us water in a way that it keeps us from catastrophic leaks for the most part. I think that's uh, right on point. I, I appreciate that. Um, Jared Clayton, we see your name. Thank you for joining us today. You were, if you weren't here, we were talking about you earlier. <laughs> um, all good things, I swear. All good things, we promise. So, Scott, thank you so much. Let me just jump back to the PowerPoint. I have a thank. Oh, never mind. We don't need to see the thank you slide. Um, <laughs> next week we have an exciting new uh, session for you, talking about. Um, we have the guest from the Denver Public Schools uh, that's going to be talking about how he uses WeatherTrack to minimize the truck rolls to a site. The, the maintenance cost of, of central visibility is reduced by using these uh, WeatherTrack tools to their best advantage. So it should be an interesting conversation from uh, Denver Public Schools. Looking forward to that. And until then, I want to highlight Scott Hunt from the city of Colorado Springs. Thank you so much for making time for us today, Scott. Thanks, Ben. It was a pleasure. It certainly was. And I look forward to seeing you all here next week. Happy Wednesday, everyone.